it would it, 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 in this board. This is a RAB, so this okay. is a very separate entity than the OSSD. Okay. Okay. You are. Wow. Do you have any interest in that? I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> so I've made the motion. Yeah. Can I second? You can second. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. All those in favor? Should grab one of these. A little more like organized. Awesome. All right. These are ours. So that was our first big decision. Hello Hi. there. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm grabbing one for Scott as well, Perfect. so he can be in the know. Can I see here? Yeah, of course. And I also brought uh, materials for you all. I've got the senior profile, which is a bit more general. And Sam, I can email it to you. And Anda, I'll um, I'll send those along to you just kind of outline some of the accomplishments of our seniors this year. And then I also brought a copy of our, um, the book that we send out to every freshman, sophomore, and junior to their homes um, that promotes all of the programs and gives them an idea of what our programs are. So um, I can also maybe send you a digital file of that as well, Anda and Sam. Okay. That's great. All right. So with that, um, I know we kind of unofficially started and I'm going to turn it over to our renewed board chair, Ashley. Wow. <laughs> this is great. Well, well welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. And our first role, our first order of business would be to welcome guests. Sure. Are there any guests? We do have some guests here today. So, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Nathan Wright. Um, I have kids that go to the uh, Randolph School, and I also help with digital marketing campaigns for RTCC. Perfect. And part of Vermont Radio Group. Part of Vermont Radio Group, yeah. Perfect. Fantastic. And then, um, I think, I'm trying to think, yes. Do I know? I'm new. <laughs> okay, so. Well, Sarah if, hopped. Oh, um, Sarah, okay. Joined in March. Okay. From Randolph. As part of the board. Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Okay, and are there any petitions to come before the board? Hearing none. Um, so the new members of the uh, advisory board, which I think we just went over, unless you want to talk about Sam. So oh, Sam, I forgot. <laughs> Sam. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Sam is uh, joining us as hopefully a potential new uh, advisory board member as well. Okay. And did I see? Were there other names on that list? There that were. Not be here tonight? There were. Um, I know that Matt Fordham is interested, but with baseball, was not going to be able to do that this spring. Um, but will probably join us in the fall. And who is my other person I had on there? I, I saw Wally. Wally, I might have. Yeah, I might have roped him into it actually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, but so we'll you know. We'll keep trying. We'll get there. We need to have three community members. Okay. So actually, Great. I think we're there if we have you, Nathan, and Sam. Okay. So. So Sam, you're official. Well, are we? Do we need to do a vote? <laughs> do we need to do a vote? I don't know, Lane. Do we on this type of board? Do we have to do a vote? Uh, I think we should. If he's going to be a vote, if he's going to be a voting member. Okay. I so would say yeah. I would love to have a nomination to elect um, Sam Hooper to the uh, RTCC Regional Advisory Board. I second. second. Oh. I need the motion. Oh, I'll make a motion to add Sam as a community member representative. So. Great. And then I'll second. Great. Um, is there any, dis uh, any discussion before we call the vote? All right, so all in favor of electing Sam Hooper as an uh, Regional Advisory Board community member, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Sam, welcome. And then we just need to do the same with Nathan. Oh, I could have done at the same time. It's okay. Sorry. So I'll make a motion for Great. Ashley Thank to you. nominate wording this right <laughs> to nominate actually, Nate and actually you know it might not be a bad thing for the minutes to represent that we've nominated Ashley as a community board member as well I hope okay. I did. okay so Ashley and Nathan you did okay, okay. all right all right so we have a motion to um, nominate Nathan Wright as a regional advisory board community member is there a second I'll second great um, any discussion before we call the vote 
All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, welcome. Thank Nathan. you. Mm -hmm. Great, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Felicia to go over the 2021-22 data. Sure, I'm just going to grab a copy. Um, so, you know, this year, I think, was a year of kind of moving us back into some sense of normalcy, um, while at the same time, I think it was anything um, but normal in just the sense that we had a lot of um, needs that I don't think we realized at the start of the year and really wouldn't have known until we started moving along throughout the year. And when I say needs, these are more um, social-emotional needs with students and um, kind of understanding their academic um, lagging points from the last couple of years and figuring out how we are going to get them to be academically proficient. Um, so I think one of the things to go into the data knowing is that we, I, we haven't met my goal of where we should be for academic proficiency. And I know I can say a lot of that is COVID, um, but I think some of that is just our delivery model. And we talked about that a little bit uh, in a couple months ago. And that is that right now we have an English teacher and a math teacher who at this point serve 158 kids. Um, next year, that'll be 167. That's just untenable. Um, it's unrealistic and untenable. And if we're looking for you know, better outcomes, then we need to increase our staffing. So um, we've put in some the request to have some before school time through ESSER funds to help with maybe some of those academics and whether that is um, at our school, the kids come earlier than the rest of the crew, or whether that is something that we partner with our sending schools and maybe think about um, paying for that teacher for that one block out of these funds, you know, we, we'll kind of figure that out as we know if those are approved. But um, we had support from our partner schools to look at having the academics taught there. Um, that was regional and it was pretty much unanimous, I would say. But when we talked to the AOE, there was really good points as to why we would keep the academics at the center. And one of the most important points is that the kids were more motivated to work harder on their academics at the tech center than they were in their traditional school. They were there learning in the way that they wanted to learn. Um, and the outcomes, the evidence has shown that the outcomes are better. So that tells me we have some work to do to get there because I don't think our, our statistics necessarily represent that at this point. So um, just to give, I, I don't really think I need to go through necessarily the senior data, um, but you know, just as some of the highlights, we had 54 seniors this year. Um, we had three female students in non-traditional programs to their gender. Um, we had um, about 46% of our senior class was on either an IEP or a 504. So that puts a little perspective into the you know, students that we serve. Um, 21 of our seniors are attending post-secondary training or education. One is intending to enter the military and 19 are planning to continue working in their program field. So um, we had also 12 juniors who applied for early college. So those numbers are, are good. I think you'll find that most kids exit the tech center with a path in mind. Um, our industry recognized credentials, kids have been earning those all year. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you know the, the goal is for every program to either offer a tier two industry recognized credential or a dual enrollment opportunity, so a college course. They can do both, but it is the expectation um, of the state that one or the other exists in every program. So that's something that many of our programs have the IRCs. I think we could improve upon our dual enrollment. Um, I, I think you'll see here, if you look in further, that seven seniors earn dual enrollment college credits. That's out of 54. I think that could be better. Um, and I think as a center, we had a total of 33 credits earned. So that's 11 courses. So just something to you know 
look at and grow and expand upon. One of the challenges for us at this moment, and it's something that I know the state is working on, is the partnerships with VTC have been a little bit challenging. Um, I think it's just the way that their setup has been, and it's left it at the um, decision of the instructors up there whether they wanted to partner with high school staff. And I think that's going to change as they, you know, go through their um, process of consolidation. But I'm hoping to see that, for example, our diesel teacher who teaches diesel up there, he should be able, with the same curriculum, to be able to offer our students college credits. At this point, that's not an option. So those are the kinds of weird little anomalies that need to be looked at. Um, we have upcoming our honors and awards for NTHS and technical excellence coming up on May 19th. We had 18 um, students who earned NTHS, 10 of which were seniors. And we had 18 seniors who earned technical excellence award, seven of which were seniors. Um, we had 167 honors and high honors awarded this year so far. And of these, 35 out of 54 were seniors that received one or more awards. So I guess moving kind of into the, the overview of the year, here are some of the, the goals that I kind of think are important for us to look at. One is I think we do a really good job on post-secondary placement, and I think that we need to continue to do that. I really I feel uncomfortable if there's ever a kid walking out of our center not knowing what their plan is the day after they graduate. Um, so we've done a really good job with that, and I want to continue to make that a, a priority. The College and Career Lab, um, as you may know, um, Jason Finley is moving over here to the high school, and we have um, in the works, we're hoping that Jeremy um, from Electrical, Jeremy Lyford, will be our new work-based learning coordinator. And the nice thing is he's got local connections, and um, I think we can continue to grow our program. But we really need to continue our focus on professional skills and professional communication, something that's been very evidently lacking this year with our students. And that's just the lag of the last couple of years, um, understanding how to be a student, how to talk to adults, um, those kinds of things. Um, we need to, as I mentioned before, improve our academic proficiency. So that's an ongoing goal. And one of the ways in which we're going to do that, the state has decided to um, buy through a grant the Work Keys curriculum for all of the technical centers. So that means that we will have really strategic um, curriculum in place to better our scores on the Work Keys assessment, which is what we do for our English or English language arts assessment, as well as our math assessment. Um, I think that having that curriculum is going to be helpful for us to guide us in understanding what they are not understanding. You know, you, it's hard to take a test uh, twice a year and not really know what the questions are and how to prepare them for it. Um, so I think that'll really help. And then a couple other goals just to continue to increase our dual enrollment and IRC attainment. And I would really like to see an increase in leadership skills among our students through a higher participation in our career and technical service organizations. So that's kind of my summary of the year. Um, I think overall it's been a good year. It's exciting to see our numbers up. I think a lot of that we can probably thank to our marketing and um, sort of the change of strategy that we did. I think a lot of it also just has to do with the fact that kids were hungry for hands-on um, after COVID. So um, yeah, I think that's all I got for you. So are there any questions for Felicia? I'll look to the camera as well. Sam or Anda, any questions? Okay. okay. Um, so I do have a question. Are there any programs that are going to phase out in 22, 23, or new ones be added? Or is your Good question. Um, right now, we are kind of in this adjustment phase of um, we need to get our six semester average up high enough so we start to get more state funding, at least while the funding source or the funding process is what it is. Um, so at this point, we're on a holding pattern as far as um, introducing any new programs. And um, ultimately, my goal, I think, originally in my Perkins plan was to have us add plumbing, um, 
next year. I think it makes a lot more sense to see where we land with this potential building out back. Um, it makes a lot more sense, I think, to start right in the structure that they're going to be teaching in um, because we just don't have a lot of space. Mm -hmm. There are no, no programs that need to be phased out. Our numbers are solid, um, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, that was my follow-up question was how you were looking at the enrollment for next year, if they are all. Looking good. We're at 167 right now, and we're not even through everything. We've still got a few um, hanging out there. And you have a waiting list in electrical again? And There's a waiting list in electrical, auto, waiting. diesel. Um, what am I, uh, construction's really close if they're not there already. Uh, I'm trying to think of Health others. careers has Health a careers big waiting list. Does, yeah. um, uh, criminal justice is as full as it can be given the space that they have. Do you have that's, that one's full. That one's full. Yep. Good. Yep. So, and a lot of them are, are healthy. They're, they may not be co totally at capacity, but they're really healthy. That's great. So. I have a quick question. Um, for juniors that are going to become seniors during the summer break, would it be beneficial for RTCC to help do summer work in the field that they're in and that they're studying? Right. So if someone's doing electrical their junior year and can continue their senior year? Yep. Would it be because I know everybody in the community needs help, even if it's just during the summer. Yep. Would that be something that would be beneficial to help it is. set them up before the end of the school year to it, work? And actually, that's a perfect segue. A lot of times, our seniors will do co-op for their senior year. Mm -hmm. And usually this time of year, Jason Finley is working hard with them to try to find a placement where they can get a summer job. And then that summer job will typically lead into their work-based placement in their senior year. Perfect. So that's, that's kind of happening, but, yeah. Yep. Okay. Good questions. Any other questions? Okay, so then we're gonna go to um, the nice segue, I guess, for okay. our staffing program and facilities update. Sure. So um, at this point, we have five positions that we are hiring for. We are needing a student services coordinator we need a one-year career and technical education school counselor. Uh, we need a work-based learning coordinator, which I think that one is pretty well buttoned up. We, because of that, need an electrical teacher. And construction trades and management we've already hired for as well. So the challenging ones at this moment that I'm finding are our student services coordinator and our school counselor positions. Um, so I'm hopeful that we're going to see, oh, and I, oh, I missed one, culinary arts. I did not put in that. So culinary arts we're also advertising for. Um, so not, you know, quite as big of a transition as last year, but certainly still significant. Felicia, are those, um, the student service coordinator and the school counselor, are those <coughs> currently filled? They are. Okay. They are. Um, and the one-year position, the, the current... CTE school counselor will be um, coming back after next year. Okay. Um, so it's just a year leave of absence. Um, but the hard part is finding someone that's willing to do just a year with that kind of licensure. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to academics, which um, they will be offered at RTCC. As I mentioned, um, the AOE recommendation is to keep them here with increased staff to meet the critical need for proficiency. Um, so as I mentioned, we're looking at some ESSER three funds to hopefully bridge a little bit of that gap this year. Um, in terms of facilities, the dental program has been made the number one priority for facilities to work on and get that room um, up to date and ready. Um, it's been a bit of a slow process and they're working hard on that. Um, in terms of other facilities things, one need that we talked about today was the bathroom situation. Um, I know it's been a conversation at the high school as well as the, the tech center. Um, I think that the having multi-stall bathrooms is just not healthy for kids, particularly in the vaping um, age, we'll say. And we have the opportunity, if we can find the funds in surplus, to potentially make two big bathrooms into six single stall bathrooms 
and it also provides more privacy and would provide the opportunity for our transgender students to be comfortable. Um, so that's something I'm hopeful we'll do. And other than that, we're not going wild and crazy with facilities um, this summer like we did last summer. Questions for Felicia? Okay. No? Uh, yeah, I, just have, okay. I have one question, Ashley. Can you hear me all right? We yes. can. Okay. Um, that's all great. That's a great report. Um, one question that I had was around the curriculum and getting those credits to apply for towards college. Um, mm -hmm. Well, what are the hoops that need to be jumped through there? Um, seems like yeah. a no-brainer in my opinion. It, it does. So here, here's what the hoops are, Sam, and I can speak from experience because I've, I've lived it. Um, prior to me having a master's degree, when I wanted to become the fast-forward teacher for my program to teach college credits, um, I had to show industry experience in that particular area. Um, so that's an important piece. I think some of the schools, because of the NIAS accreditation, have said you have to have your master's. So there's this weird rub, at least in my mind, where like VTC for adjunct faculty like us, we need to have our master's, but their faculty doesn't on campus. So I don't really know where the disconnect is. Um, but so part of the problem is getting our teachers um, accepted as instructors in these schools. So that's that's probably the number one problem. Uh, the number two problem is some of these schools have limits, like you have to have at least four kids to take a class. And some of our programs, not every kid is ready for that dual enrollment credit and nor the, the kind of work that's required of it. But the program may not have four kids that are interested and then therefore the class can't run. So those are a couple barriers uh, that I know um, they're talking about at the college level, and hopefully they'll kind of work through. We've talked about the possibility of consolidating with other tech centers and having teachers of record working together, um, kind of hoping that will work. But And so those protocols are set by colleges and, and universities, um, not by the state of Vermont? Correct, I think. Um, I know they work with the AOE um, because they receive also Perkins money. So the Perkins money that we receive and they receive is kind of their hand in hand. Um, so I think there are some expectations and stipulations and that I know that those two things have come up as things to negotiate. So hopefully maybe that'll look a little different this year. So. Okay, yeah, cool. I think we can get that so that there's no reason that should be holding us back it's right stupid. yep <laughs> <laughs> you're right uh, all right great thanks sam thanks felicia for a, a nice report um and i do think that you have touched upon this on the recruitment enrollment yep. and retention but did you have anything to add to that? I don't think so. I think I said everything earlier, yeah. just that we have healthy numbers. 167 is up. Oh gosh, we started at 159, so mm -hmm. that's, that's up a little Great. bit from this year. Um, so we're that's going right. in the right direction. Good, thank you. Um, and then the, anything for the professional development focus? Like yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier the work keys curriculum integration. That's one piece that we're going to be looking at this year. The other thing is we have set up um, Stephanie, our new school nurse, which is awesome having our own nurse, by the way. Um, she's set up for us to have professional development training in mental health first aid for students. And then we will also train all of our students. So everybody will get that certification next year. So, so I'll say that out loud. That's great. Yeah, That's good. it's yeah. needed. It is great. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and we'll quickly look to Lane to see if he has anything uh, as a superintendent report before we go back to Felicia. I can touch on a couple of the topics that uh, Felicia did a, a very good job of kind of presenting. Um, you know, the hope is it sounds like as we were having this discussion about how do we improve the academics and how do we get the 
students connected with the academic teachers more often and with less of a workload. Um, in talking with the AOE, it sounds like the legislature was actually working on a pretty big revamp potentially of what the funding system um, was going to be for the tech center, which is one, one of the reasons that they've asked us to kind of hold off for a year or so. Um, right now, I think one of the biggest things that, that we've encountered this year is, you know, we try to keep tuitions reasonable, but Felicia's done a good job of increasing the enrollments, getting the enrollments up there, but there's a three-year lag time between when the enrollments go up and we get the extra fundings to support that. So, you know, we're getting funding for 128 kids this year, but yet she's got about 160 students that we still have to provide coverage and education for. And it'll be time before those new enrollments, the funding that goes along with them, catches up. So I, I think that's important for folks to know. With the ESSER funding, we did look at expanding programs. Um, I did have them actually look at the, the potential building space, the new building trades. Yeah. Um, the minimum dollar cost of that um, is in the three to five million dollar range. Okay. Um, so it's possible, especially potentially in the future, um, as the state and the legislature is taking a look at the facility survey uh, that's out there right now, which is hopefully going to inform them on you know what they need to set aside um, to be able to help districts kind of renovate and modernize. Um, and so hopefully that's something that may be coming at some point in time. Um, so pretty much the, the biggest pieces that I wanted to kind of oh actually one one more because it'll be coming up um, next year in negotiations. Um, while we don't typically have difficulty hiring teachers, um, given our pay scale, um, we do have trouble hiring technical center teachers. And one of the reasons is because of how the contract over many years is structured. Um, a teacher who comes into the technical center, they have to spend six years of working experience. That allows them to get onto the bachelor's column and then every two years of experience after that advances them one. And so because of that contractual hurdle um, that is there with the union, it makes it very difficult for us to be competitive with the other technical centers. And I think a piece of that too, if you don't mind me saying, Lane, is that uh, a person that comes in licensed with teaching experience still is subject to this two years equals one. So I could have come, for example, from Hartford with 22 years of teaching experience and I would be on step 11. That's not, um, the way to entice teachers into our district, <laughs> so. And, and so that's something that when we hit negotiations this, this next time around, that yeah. I'll, I'll try to bring up. I mean, there will be a cost to the district, but there's a responsibility for us to be trying to make sure that you know we're competitive. Yeah. So I have a question. So are those teacher contracts part of the entire OSSD mm -hmm. teacher contracts? Yes, there's a little section. Yeah. The CDM. Yeah. 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 Okay. And the uh, reason it, hadn't come up before is that with COVID hit there was a lot of a lot of staffing turnover and so it was really the first time that we were hiring people at, at the tech center and you know started to look at the rules behind them it's like this is crazy yeah. um, just it's not the way to do it I mean there's lots of ways um, and things that we could could look at to try to make things a little bit better I mean usually 15 hours in, a, in an accredited program even if it's not a college pro program is equal to a, you know a full credit from a college, so there's conversion tables and things that you can use, but I think it's something that needs to be addressed if you want to. And the other thing that some CTE centers are doing in their contracts is they're actually looking at industry certifications of these teachers. So if they're, for example, a master electrician, that should count for something, yeah. because that's a lot of education that went into that. Um, so. And so I don't know when those rules originally happened uh, in the CTE, but I think they've been there for a while. It's time, yeah. time to I don't think so. Um, the only other thing I guess I just want to say is that we may need to meet one more time before the end of the year. Um, actually, not a May. We will need to meet one more time before the end of the year. Um, so it's a little, I, I know it, I promised you four meetings, but there will be a, an extra one due to the fact that we're in the comprehensive local needs assessment and that needs to be um, okayed by you all. And then it also needs to be okayed by our board. I will keep you posted. I'm still working on it. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's been a, it's, it was a curious year with some of these reports because it was like, oh, you don't have to do them well. Maybe you really do, and then no, you definitely do. Well, and this was supposed to originally be a mid-year, like we did a four-year comprehensive when we started the Perkins plan two years ago, and 
we were sold this bill of goods that said the two-year one was going to be just really like a where you at kind of thing. Well, it's been 100% even more work than the original one. Um, yeah, the state, so. state tried to streamline things because of all the analysis we had to do to get the grant funding. They were trying to allow us to use uh, the reports from the grant funding to be able to not have to do the typical. Um, for me, it's the, the continuous improvement plan, but then they came back and said, oh, you know, federal government is really requiring this. So that's the, the mad scramble right now. So I want to be aware of the time, but I do also just want to share um, a, a concern in what I heard you say, in that next year there's going to be 167 students, and the funding available is for 128, which yes. is 39 students, which in my mind is significant on a lack of funding. Right. So I just, and again, I don't want to put you guys on the spot. Legislative change has to happen. Yeah, it's at the state level. And they're talking about it. Yeah, it's, at, it's there. Um, this is not just unique to our tech center. Um, obviously, this is the sa same way for all tech centers. Um, I think originally that funding process happened so that there wouldn't be deep dives and, and dips, depending on enrollment. Um, but in terms of actually having the funds that you need to operate each year, I, I think it was counterproductive. So. Yeah, it's, great, it's great if you have a if you have an enrollment loss. It's not so good if you have an enrollment increase. Mm -hmm. and, and they produced a pretty significant enrollment increase over yeah. the last, last two years coming out of COVID. Yeah. But you feel confident that we're going to be able to support the programs appropriately with the funding that we have with the higher enrollment? The biggest yeah. issue is the academic. Yeah. Um, if we're keeping the academic teachers here and trying to provide like the math and the ELA, um, that's going to be difficult because, like uh, Felicia pointed out, if they've got a workload of 150 students, that's twice yep. twice what the norm is um, in Vermont, and so that's an incredibly difficult task for you know, that teacher to be able to. And and Jen Joel's has kind of been looking at some possible scheduling that will streamline and and hopefully help us with this and make it a little less chaotic for our academic teachers. Um, integrating more of our content from our programs into those academic classes to have a little bit higher engagement. So I think, I think we'll be okay. We just have to get through this year. Yeah. Yeah. And, see, and see what they come up with the funding changes. Yeah. So one more bit of business before we um, call it a night, and that is the approval of the consent agenda, which includes the minutes of February 3rd. So assuming you've all had a chance to read those, if I could have a motion to accept the minutes as presented. So moved. Second? Second. Great. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, anything else? I think I'm good. I'll just keep you posted when I'm done with my CLNA, and we'll, we'll set up another meeting. Elaine, anything else? Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming, and thanks, Sam. Thanks, Anda. Thank you.